Uh, moving on to our next lecture, uh, we are welcoming Ms. Uh, Mr. Dara Connolly. He graduated from the University of Portsmouth, where he was the president of the Pharmacy Students Association. And he is currently the proprietor of Haven Pharmacy Connolly's and is the president of the Irish Pharmacy Union. He was elected at the position in 2016. In the next lecture, we will have a chance to hear more about pharmacy vaccination in Ireland. Mr. Connolly, the virtual room is all yours. Good evening, Katerina. Can you hear me? Hello, Katerina? Yes, yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings from Dungarvan in County Waterford. My name is Dara Connolly, and I am a community pharmacist here uh, in fact, I'm a third generation community pharmacist. My grandmother qualified as a pharmacist in 1922, nearly 100 years ago. So I'm very proud to talk to you this evening about your uh, virtual congress. And I really love the themes that you've chosen, which are to innovate, to adapt, and to implement. I have great news for you and for all pharmacists in Europe that we have a very successful influenza vaccination program running here in Ireland, which started in 2012. So uh, I'm looking forward to sharing this with you over the next 40, 45 minutes. To give you a little bit of background, pharmacy in Ireland is practiced, as I practice is here predominantly in my pharmacy, you can see my dispensary in the background, and you may even recognize some of the drugs that are here. Ireland is a small country, as you can see from the map, on the periphery of Europe, and we have a population of 4.8 million people. Pharmacy in Ireland is deregulated and has been so since 2002. So that means there are absolutely no restrictions on the ownership of a pharmacy. So as long as you can prove that you are of good standing and you have money to do so, you may open and you may own a pharmacy. And there are no restrictions, which are very common throughout the rest of Europe, about where you may open a pharmacy, whether the need exists or not. It is based on being a completely commercial decision for the establishment of pharmacy. I think another thing to point out as well, as I travel throughout Europe, and as you will see the pictures of common pharmacies in Ireland in the slide, we practice pharmacy differently here when we see other European countries. Pharmacies are more disposed towards the clinical element of what we do, which is that they just have dispensaries, and the main focus of visiting a pharmacy in many countries in Europe is to see the pharmacist or have something that is related to healthcare. As you can see from the pictures of the pharmacies here, we do many more things than that in pharmacies in Ireland. And in some ways, we are also drug stores where one can purchase cosmetics. We also are very good at helping people with uh, photography, be it digital or the old school photography as well. And we're really good for nutritional supplements. And there's lots and lots of things that we do. So if you were visiting Ireland from another European country, you may see that there is an alignment between what some European countries have as drug stores and then as separate dispensary pharmacies. There are 1,850 community pharmacies in Ireland, and the majority of those pharmacists, despite the ownership rules, are owned and operated by pharmacists or those pharmacists' families. We do have some corporate pharmacy chains in Ireland. Uh, Lloyd's is owned by McKesson. Boots is owned by uh, Allianz, Wal Allianz Walgreens Boots Alliance, as it is now. And then there is an indigenous wholesaler called Allcare, who own pharmacies and also have franchise pharmacies. These three largest chains, as you can see from the figures, 
account for about maybe 200 pharmacies, 210 pharmacies. So roughly speaking, 85% of pharmacies in Ireland are owned and operated by pharmacists and their families. When we look at the demographics of pharmacy in Ireland, the gender of the pharmacy owner is 57% male, 22% female, and 21% is co-owned by male and female owners. The age ranges we have for pharmacy owners in Ireland are 1.5% are 25 to 34 years of age, 41% are the next category, which is 35 to 44. The next category, is 34 to 34.6% is aged between 45 to 54, and 18.8% is 55 to 64. 4.5%, as you would imagine, is those who are above retirement age. So as you can see from that nice graphic, there is a very good spread of people who are established who own their own pharmacies in Ireland. As you can imagine, it would take some financial wherewithal to own or to set up or to buy a pharmacy. So that's what we see as being a career, very popular career choice for young pharmacists as they get some experience and some backing behind them. We are very lucky in Ireland that we are hugely valued by the people who are most important to us, and those are our patients and customers. When we go out and ask those people what they think of their pharmacists and what they think of the services that we provide, I'm delighted to share with you that we find that 96% of people we ask value the professional advice that they receive from their pharmacists. 92% of people are in favor of their pharmacists providing services to improve medicine adherence. And 94% of people trust pharmacists to recommend the right non-prescription medicine for them. Very pertinent to my talk this evening is that 75% of people are happy to get the flu vaccination in a pharmacy. Part of the reason why we were able to drive forward the influenza vaccination service through pharmacies is as part of our regulations by our regulator, the Pharmaceutical Society of Ireland is that every pharmacy has a private consultation room where we can go and make sure that the person has a private and proper clinical consultation with their pharmacist. Having done the background, the next part of my talk is to talk you through vaccination in pharmacies in Ireland. So I'd like to start by looking at the background, the challenges, the requirements, the promotion, the remuneration, and the review of the services that we conduct. The background to vaccination in Ireland is that we continue to strive as the Irish Pharmacy Union, of which I'm president, to look at doing what we can do best for our patients using our clinical knowledge and to indeed innovate, to adapt and implement. In 2008, the Pharmaceutical of Ireland strategy for the future of pharmacy services, and just to give you the detail behind that, Mine is the representative body, the Irish Pharmacy Union, and we represent 95% of pharmacists in Ireland. We are regulated through the Pharmacy Act of 2007 by the Pharmaceutical Society of Ireland. They are an innovative body as well as we are, and when they looked at their strategy for the future of pharmacy services, they included that vaccination for influenza and vaccination more broadly should be services that we would be able to implement here in our practices in our communities, such as mine here in Dungarvan. You'll be aware that back in 2009, there was a H1N1 swine flu outbreak. There was a national vaccination campaign launched, and what became very apparent very quickly was that there were not enough general practitioners, that is, family physicians, to vaccinate everybody if that pandemic had happened here in Ireland. We have 1,400 pharmacists were trained in vaccination technique, but they weren't used. By way of a little bit of background to this as well, I don't know if many of you know how our economy works here in Ireland, but we have a very, very strong agriculture sector. If you were to consider the 
devastating effect it would have on our ability to export live meat or any meat products from the country if we had a bovine or a, 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 swine, a swine flu, a porcine flu, a bovine flu or an avian flu here in Ireland. It would have a detrimental effect for our ability to operate as an economy. One of the things that we might touch on later in the questions and answers section is that I would encourage you not just to think of how vaccination works from the level of being a pharmacist and being a healthcare practitioner. I think it's also important that you look at the broader aspect it will have for your country. If there were a swine flu outbreak or if there were an avian flu outbreak, how it would affect people who live and work in agriculture and live and work on farms or live and make their living through uh, working in meat processing or selling meat or transporting meat. The devastating effect was seen by our government. So in 2011, the minister legislated to allow pharmacists to supply and administer through vaccination without prescription. In 2015, unicocal and shingles vaccine were added to the list of vaccines that may be supplied and administered without prescription by community pharmacists to their patients in their locality. Any time that any new service is proposed to be implemented by community pharmacists, there's always going to be an element of pushback. Some of that pushback is predictable. Other elements of that pushback is not so predictable. What won't come as any surprise to you or to any of our pharmacy colleagues throughout Europe or the world for that matter, is that there was virulent opposition from medical professionals. They believed that vaccination was their professional birthright. They believed that pharmacists were unqualified to manage the risks, and they scaremongered about anaphylaxis risk. Indeed, some pharmacists themselves were uncomfortable with vaccinating and unsure how to integrate this into daily practice. So to remind you, as Katerina politely introduced me earlier, I'm old enough to tell you that I was qualified as a pharmacist in the last century. So when I qualified in the School of Pharmacy in Portsmouth in 1997, I wasn't trained to vaccinate as you are now, I hope, as you go through the School of Pharmacy where you are. I had to retrain and I had to consider the cost of my retraining, the time that it would take away from my practice, my ability to integrate being a vaccinating pharmacist operating this service and the overheads that that includes into my daily practice. I had to take the long view that this was something that I wanted to be able to provide for my patients. And that in a way, I even wanted to go as far as to challenge myself in my practice as a pharmacist when I was maybe 14 or 15 years qualified, that it was a good thing for my professional development to add more services to what I can provide to my patients to be able to do that here in a, in, in a safe and accessible way for them. One of the other barriers that we came across were that the public themselves, that is the patients or the consumers, were not familiar with the concept of pharmacy and vaccination, which is completely understandable because it was something completely new for them. We often look around and see role models or we have preconceived ideas of what people do in their jobs on a day-to-day -day basis. So as I'm sure there is in Croatia, there are lots of people in Ireland who think that pharmacists just stick labels on boxes and that's the end of it. The people who know us and understand us the most are the people who use our services the most, whether it's for themselves or whether it's for their parents or whether it's for their children. So what we have been able to do is win over the confidence, as you have seen from the previous slide, of the general public who are now very comfortable around the idea of the concept of pharmacies providing vaccination services. The big point that we have in all of this is that in the healthcare system in Ireland, Pretty much 85% of the services that we supply to patients, and we have a mixture of publicly and private and co-funded payments to pharmacists, depending on the means, on the uh, ability of the patient to pay. What we required was a big leap of faith by our politicians, and that would be embodied in our Minister for Health at the time, who himself had, is a general practitioner, a, a family doctor. Uh, Dr. James O'Reilly. It took a leap of faith of pharmacists such as myself to be able to say that I think this is a worthwhile 
service for me to provide and that it won't affect my ability to carry out the other vital services I have here in my pharmacy. And also then that there was a leap of faith needed by patients to trust us to be able to say that they would take the opportunity to have their seasonal influenza vaccination from their community pharmacist rather than to queue up and get it from their general practitioner, that is their family doctor. How did we overcome those challenges? So we would start off by saying you focus on the people who are most important. And the people who are most important in the pharmacy aren't the pharmacists, aren't the staff, aren't the family doctors, aren't the general practitioners, aren't the politicians, the, the patients. So we started by having an ongoing public awareness campaign. And we found out that the public wanted to access more services from the pharmacists. And we made sure that that message went out there repeatedly tirelessly and at every opportunity. So long before this became law, we were having ministerial meetings. We were having political briefings, either with parties who were in government at the time or parties who were in, oper in, in opposition. And we also made sure that we were doing lots and lots of media interviews to get that message across. A vital key in making sure that this made sense to politicians and to other healthcare professionals, that we had the support of the national immunization office which is part of our department of health and a state-run body that they also needed and wanted an improved accessibility for patients to vaccination as i mentioned just a minute ago the health minister concerned at the time was a former general practitioner who understood the issues particularly around safety and convenience that go with a proper vaccination service so it was easier for us perhaps to deal with him despite the fact that maybe some of his brother and sister general practitioners and medics didn't like the idea that a general practitioner would give the go ahead to pharmacists to do what they thought was their birthright. The pharmacy regulator played a key role in refuting the medical organization claims about competency and safety. We were able to display through international best practice and through working with our colleagues in the pharmacy grouping of the European Union, with our colleagues in the American Pharmacists Association, the Canadian Pharmacists Association, the Guild of Pharmacists in Australia and also New Zealand, and with our colleagues in the National Pharmacy Association in the United Kingdom, we were able to show that there was no evidence of additional risk to other countries where our pharmacists vaccinated. Intensive group training developed pharmacist skills and also their confidence. And as I said earlier, I was part of that initial group who went through with a pioneer attitude to say that these were things that we wanted to do and we wanted to do them for the betterment of our profession. But most importantly, that there was a definite public health need and that we wanted to be part of being able to answer that public health need. <clears throat> with professional and service standards, real-time record keeping requirements were needed because we wanted to operate to a higher standard than that operated by in terms of record keeping and in terms of data collation than our colleagues in family medicine and general practice were operating at at that time and let it be said that we still operate to a higher standard than they do in terms of record keeping and making sure that that data that we collect has a proper epidemiological resource that we can share with other healthcare professionals and indeed through our colleagues that we have in the PGEU and other pharmacy bodies throughout the world to help them to make their case to their politicians and their regulators that this is a really, really worthwhile service. The requirements that we have are mandatory accredited training, which is face-to-face -face or it can be done online that we have up-to-date vaccination policies, that we retrain every year on our injection technique, and that most importantly, that we have the ability to manage anaphylaxis, and that includes the administration of ephedrine. We are also trained in cardiopulmonary resuscitation and the use of defibrillators. <clears throat> One of the very beneficial and maybe unintended consequences of having 1,400 pharmacists who are so accessible to patients is, is that we know in the last 12 months that pharmacists have been able to resuscitate three people who have suffered heart attacks just by 
being on the street and close to where they are because we are community pharmacists embedded in their pharmacy. Because we have the skills and because we have the competency and the practice to do so, we have now are seen as a first stop shop when people are in difficulty on the street and they see that maybe a friend or a neighbor or somebody has fallen on the street and they may be having uh, atrial fibrillation or they may be having a cardiac arrest and we are able to come and help. This is an unseen or unintended consequence of us training such a high standard in cardiopulmonary resuscitation and in the use of defibrillators. One of the most important things to bear in mind when it comes to the administration, the physical administration of the vaccine, that it must only be carried out in a community pharmacy. It must be carried out in the private consultation room in that pharmacy, and that we must have patient consent, which is written, and that patient consent is gone through very, very strictly and very stringently with those patients to inform them of what an influenza uh, attack that they may suffer would be, what the symptoms are and what the outcomes are. We also have another cohort of people who come to us to be vaccinated who are carers or close family members of people who are in a very high risk category. If you could imagine if you were caring for somebody who was undergoing chemotherapy, it wouldn't be a good idea for you to be a vector for a seasonal influenza that if you were to infect them because you had not been vaccinated yourself. We then make sure that we have written and full consent from that patient before we go ahead with the physical, uh, with the physical vaccination. We also very carefully check people's allergy status and we make sure that we observe the patient after the administration of the vaccine for a minimum of 15 minutes and that this is understood by the patient before and after they have had the vaccine administered. In our record keeping, we make sure that they, we have the date, the patient identification number, the batch, and the expiry date of the vaccine. And a really, uh, I think, cool element of what we do and why it's better than when patients get their vaccination from a general practitioner. We upload details online to our Department of Health to let them know who has been vaccinated, at what time they have been, vaccinated, most importantly, under which criteria we vaccinated them. One of the things that's really, really key to good practice in pharmacy is to make sure that we are leaving behind a body of evidence that tells people who we vaccinated and why we vaccinated <clears throat> in order for that data to be analyzed. So our National Immunization Office can keep track of who is being vaccinated and who isn't. And if they can see that there is a particular shortfall in a patient cohort, for example, people who suffer from diabetes may not be taking up the opportunity to have their vaccinations, they can target that group and explain to them that did they realize or did they know that they have access to pre vaccinations from their community pharmacists, which may be more convenient for them than queuing up at a doctor's surgery or having to make an appointment to get that. As I was alluding to there, we have a target population for flu vaccination. So our flu vaccination recommend, is recommended in the case of people who are aged 65 and over, people who are undergoing therapies for long-term medical conditions such as diabetes, for people, as I may have mentioned, who have an impaired immune system. So an example of that would be people who are undergoing chemotherapy, for patients who are Down syndrome, cancer patients, whether they're going through treatment or not. For people who are morbidly obese, which is a body mass index of 40 or more. For pregnant women, for residents of nursing homes, for healthcare workers and for carers. And again, to go back to the really important part of knowing and realizing the dangers that are there with porcine flu or with avian flu, that people who come in contact with poultry, waterfowl and pigs, it's really important that they too are vaccinated. The vaccine is free for those people. The actual injection itself is paid for by our government uh, through its health service. Once we have established that somebody falls into those categories of a target population, 
and is then uh, it is free for them to get a influenza vaccine or to be paid for by the government. We then rely on the government telling us whether that person, that patient, is eligible to free health care or whether that patient will have to make a private contribution to the cost and the overhead of the service employed by the pharmacist. We know this because as we log on using the unique health identifier that we have for those patients, we can check in real time whether that person has a free vaccination in totality, as in the vaccine will be paid for and my service as a community pharmacist will be paid for, or if I must ask that patient for a co-payment if they are a private patient, and that co-pay that co-payment is one that they then make to me there and then when they've had their vaccination. We have a very good unit within our health service executive who deal specifically with health promotion. So I hope that those slides are coming across nicely for you because they show very graphically really good ideas to get across to people. Maybe not even the people who know they need it, who are over 65 or maybe diabetic, but people who fall into the other categories of maybe having a lowered immune system or they may be carers or they may be caring for somebody who has Down syndrome. So what we knew that we had to do was that we had to win hearts and minds. And it's one way to explain to fellow healthcare professionals what it is you want to do and how you go about quoting the statistics and quoting abstracts and making a very robust scientific or epidemiological case. The other end of the spectrum, and it's something pharmacists throughout the world are really good at, is helping to make sense for people who are not healthcare professionals about what good healthcare is. So I hope you can get a flavor of the leaflets that we produced in conjunction with our health service executive about getting the facts about flu to people and to let them know that the common misconceptions that people have, that getting a flu vaccination will give you the flu and other things that people have as barriers to actually accessing this kind of really vital healthcare service are things that they needn't worry about. When we do things in the Irish Pharmacy Union, we go at it uh, 100%. We go at it full tilt. So we engaged at our own expense in radio advertising and in leafleting. And again, I hope you will be able to see through the slides the very specific way and bullet pointed way that we were able to engage with patients or to ask patients that they would engage with people that they know who could benefit from the flu vaccination. So we put together in conjunction with uh, our regulator and in conjunction with our department, really good patient information leaflets which have stood the test of time. When we go about putting together a new service through our community pharmacies, the first thing that we must be really, really aware of is we must be able to do this and be recompensed to be paid to do it. My time is important to me and it's important to my staff and it's important to my patients and it's up to me to make sure that we're using that time to best effect. If we cannot pay our overheads, we cannot supply any of the services that we have to any of our patients, whether it's vaccination or it's conversations around concordance or adherence to their medicine, whether that is over the counter or through prescription medicine. So it was really important for us that we would get a fair remuneration for the work involved, the overheads that are involved. So how we were able to negotiate with this with the government is, is that we see who should have their vaccination paid for by the government, who should have to make a co-payment, and who shouldn't get any intervention from the government at all, that they should just be dealt with as private patients. So if you scan through the graph, you can see that the free vaccine is available to the people who really, really need it. That is the physical vaccine. So that is available for free to people who are 65 years of age and older with a medical card. Medical card means that you get all your medical services free, and that is means tested. So if your income is below a certain level, you get your medical card for free. Some people who are over 65, have means to pay, so they will get the vaccination for free, but they have to pay the pharmacist for the service itself. 
If we look at people who are under 65, people aged between 18 and 64 who are at risk and have a medical card, will have the vaccine for free and the vaccination, that is the service, for free. People who are 18 to 64 in Ireland who are at risk but don't have a medical card, that is, they have the means to pay for their own health care, will get the vaccine for free because they are at risk, but they will have to pay the pharmacist for the service. If we look at all other patients who are 18 years and older, who do not fit into the criteria, as you've seen in the other slides, they will pay for the vaccine and they will also pay for the vaccination. I think this is a very fair way to operate a vaccination service because these are the people who are, whilst it is important that they get a flu vaccination, when we look at the World Health Organization recommendations as to who should be vaccinated, and we look at the own, our own objectives within our own healthcare system as to who should be vaccinated, these people don't fall into either cohort. <clears throat> it is very rare that somebody would come to a pharmacist in Ireland. This wouldn't be exceptional, but it would be rare that somebody would come to a pharmacist in Ireland who is concerned about their own health care and is concerned about the health care of people that they are close to, that they wouldn't fall into a category where we would be able to give them a vaccine for free. When it comes down to what we get paid by the government, <clears throat> The flu vaccination is supplied by the health service for eligible at-risk patients. The health service pays pharmacists a professional fee of 15 euros per eligible patient. Non-state funded patients must pay a fee to the pharmacist. And what's interesting in this is, as a representative body, we are precluded by the law under the Competition Act to recommend to any of our members that they should charge any fee, whether it be higher, lower, or whatever that might be to any of our members. So as you could imagine in a professional setting such as pharmacy, if we are charging the government 15 euros per eligible patient, it probably makes sense that we will be charging a larger amount, not considerably, a larger amount to patients who don't fall under those categories. If you can imagine in any healthcare system, we know that there will be a very viable throughput of patients coming to us through the public schemes, but not necessarily through the private schemes. So I can only speak for myself, but it is important to give you an idea of what those charges would be. So if a, <clears throat> if a patient is a private patient and registered here with me in my pharmacy, and I already have their details on my database, the amount of work I have to do for them is less. So I charge them what I charge the government, which is 15 euros. If that person is not a patient of mine and on my database, and I haven't, and I have to go through putting them as a new patient on my database, I typically charge those patients 20 euros. The non-state funded patients must pay a fee to the pharmacist. Those are the ones who pay the uh, 20 euros to me. In other places, it could be more, it could be less. I, I, I wouldn't know, and it's not my business to go and find out whether the practitioner is charged. Because this is deemed a medical service, there is no value added or sales tax with this service. <clears throat> Any good process that you go through, whether it be scientific, scientific or a branch of that in epidemiology. It's really, really important to review who you are, what you do, and why you do it. So the most important people, as I keep saying, when we went back to have a review of the service, are the patients. We, so we started our review by, asking, by looking at patients on their feedback on the vaccination service provided in pharmacies. So in March 2016, which is the most up-to-date data that we have, the full flu year, of 17 and 18. That data will have finished on the 31st of March, which is only a fortnight ago. So it, this is the most up-to-date data that we have for you. One in six patients who attended a pharmacy for a flu vaccination, it was their first time getting a flu vaccination. What was really, really pertinent to us when we made sure that the politicians and the health regulators understood why it was a good idea for pharmacists to be able to provide this service to patients who needed it was, we knew that lots of people who needed it felt that they couldn't access 
the care of a doctor in general practice. And it was an off-putting uh, system for them to engage in. And they found it much more easy to engage with their community pharmacists, who oftentimes would know them better than their own general practitioner because of their particular health needs. 32% of the respondents who received the flu vaccine in the pharmacy did so for the first time. So that's that's our that that's our figure. And we're really, really pleased with that. What's really great ingratiating to know as well is that 68% of patients returned to the pharmacy for their flu vaccination. I think by any yardstick or by any measure, if people don't like what you're doing, they won't come back and ask you to do it again. The other aspect that we looked at in our review of the service was the motivation to attend the pharmacy for a flu vaccine. 47% of people said it was because of the convenience. 28% of people said it was because it was more efficient. 13% of people, and this would be absolutely and predominantly the people who are private patients who would have had to pay the private fee to their general practitioner for their influenza vaccination, 13% of people said it was because of cost. When we looked at the satisfaction with the service, we found that 95% of people were very satisfied with the information they received from their pharmacist about the vaccination. What we know we're good at as pharmacists, and we probably don't spend enough time telling people that we know we're good at it, is that we're really good at telling people about their medicines and really good about telling people about their health. I think that is a really, really good reflection that we are good at that and we continue to be good at it and strive to be better at it. That's reflected in the 95% figure. 93% of the people rated the overall flu service. They gave it a score of nine out of 10. So that is a really, really big endorsement of what we do. And the overwhelming, as in 99% of people, would be likely to return to a pharmacist for their flu vaccination. I hope there are lots and lots of questions about that. I have, as I hope you can hear from me, a huge enthusiasm about new services and pharmacies. I am delighted to be able to say that all of those barriers that we came up against, that we were able to overcome them. And the people who matter most are the patients, and they're the ones who I'm sure are asking you in the practice of pharmacy in Croatia, as they are throughout Europe and the world, for their pharmacists to do more. So I really want you to know that there is lots more that pharmacists can do. But don't be afraid to go out there and challenge other people who say that you can. Dear Mr. Connolly, thank you a lot for your lecture. It was really interesting to hear all of the experience from Ireland. I was wondering, do you know, uh, uh, is the vaccination available in other countries? And in which ones? Do you have any idea? Thank you. Um, from who did you take examples to start the vaccination in Ireland? Yeah, that's a really good question. The people that we work very closely with in international pharmacy are, needless to say, our English-speaking colleagues, and also through, and you'll see the logo on my slides, are the pharmacy grouping of the European Union. <clears throat> we got really good data back from our colleagues in Canada, really good data back from our colleagues in uh, the United States of America. But I suppose the one that we saw which was most relevant, not to us as pharmacists, but when we went out and had to talk to our politicians and our healthcare uh, civil servants, was when we used the examples of uh, what was going on in the United Kingdom, our closest neighbor. And as you all know, we share a border with the United Kingdom in uh, between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. We share a lot of cross cultural references in how we look at things and how pharmacy operates between the United Kingdom and Ireland. There is a different mix of public and private in Ireland where everything is public in the United Kingdom. But as we went to explain to people that this is something that works very well in these countries that are a lot like us, that was a really, really good starting point. And through the collaboration of the PGEU, and through the other fora that we work in, we were able to cooperate with those people 
and get some really thank good you, data. Thank you for your answer. And uh, there is a question from my colleague Zvonimir. He was wondering, what would you advise to other countries' pharmacy societies on implementing this system in their own health uh, system? One of the things that's really important with this is, and I'd like to stress it again, when I have <coughs> spoken to colleagues, particularly from Austria and from Denmark, who don't have uh, access for patients to flu for vaccinations through pharmacies, I have asked them, have they gone to their departments of agriculture to say what would be the economic impact of an outbreak of swine flu, and I think particularly of Denmark, because they have such a huge uh, porcine industry, meat industry there, to say to them, what is the outcome for your country if there was an outbreak of swine flu? Because I would imagine in the same way, general practitioners wouldn't be in a position in Denmark <clears throat> to be able to quickly vaccinate the entire population. So. Rather than maybe sometimes thinking of looking at this just through the lens of being healthcare professionals and only working with your Department of Health, <clears throat> if one is to work with Departments of Agriculture, and then the knock-on effect of a swine flu epidemic would be how much revenue would the state lose by having to subsidize the uh, culling of animals and all that goes with it, how would they be able to afford not to do this? To be more specific, Katerina, about how you go about talking to health legislators and to other legislators, whether they are in then finance, because the finance people will turn around and say, this is going to cost more money. Really, the argument to make is, is that it costs money to treat people who have suffered an influenza viral infection. It costs a lot more money for them to be treated in a hospital or if they lose time from work, than it does to implement a broad and specific uh, influenza uh, uh, vaccination through pharmacies and also through general practice. One of the other things that I point out when I go back uh, to the slide where we talked about was there resistance from other professionals. There will always be resistance from other professionals, but the thing to bear in mind is the argument has been one on safety, the argument has been one on competency, but the argument still needs to be made that when we see our figures in Ireland, people are still attending their GP to get their flu vaccination through the normal process of their three monthly or six monthly visit to their general practitioner. What we have seen is, is there is a general uplift in the amount of people being vaccinated that was never there when it was done solely through general practitioners. So rather than saying to general practitioners that we are going to take over what it is that you do, I think it's really important to stress to them and to all healthcare professionals that this is a complementary service. And that is witnessed by the fact that we upload all our data in real time so that every general practitioner in the country knows instantaneously if their patient has been vaccinated for the flu and what their health status is in real time. That's Thank really, you really for important. your answer. And we have another question from Eva. Uh, she asked, do you think additional vaccines should be added to the list of, uh, of the vaccines that can be administered? Uh, the answer is I do. So as you would have seen from the second or the third slide is, is that we are now able to administer immunococcal vaccinations and we're also able to administer shingles vaccinations. If there is an element of disappointment for us about this, it is not to the broad range of patients that we would like because it is a service that is not funded by the state. So that means if a patient presents to me who wishes to be vaccinated for shingles, they must pay for the entirety of that service to me, regardless of their means. However, if they were to attend a general practitioner, they would have that either co-funded or funded or free. 
in the case of the Munococca. So it's something that we're working on, that we need to press the case with our legislators and with the people who pay the bill to say that it makes sense that we would be able to do this. In the broader scope of vaccination, <clears throat> I would see that the skill of vaccinating is the same as the skill that you would have to administer an intramuscular injection. So I'm sure uh, it doesn't take a great leap of imagination to see that if somebody needs an intramuscular injection of, for example, Humira, they are coming to you as a patient who is initiating on that therapy of Humira, who has never in their life seen an injection before. But in, how it works here in Ireland now is, is that that therapy is either initiated in a hospital through an outpatient appointment, or that therapy is initiated in their own homes, and they are visited by a state-registered nurse who, at great expense to, that, uh, to the state, spends a day traveling from wherever that is to that patient uh, to show them and to how to administer the uh, intramuscular injection of Humira, for example. What we would be pressing our government to say and our Department of Health is, because I'm a vaccinating pharmacist, it isn't any great upskilling for me to actually do that service for that patient in my pharmacy, to get them initiated so that they can go home and they can do that themselves, rather than having to go to a hospital or rather than having to go to the expense of having a nurse come to make a domiciliary visit to them. We would also like to think then that there is a cohort of patients out there who don't have a backup service to that. So if you can imagine the manual dexterity that you need to administer a Humira injection to yourself once a month or every two weeks, if you're an older person who's suffering from arthritis, that you may not have the manual dexterity to do that. Those people currently have to make an appointment and go and see their general practitioner or to see a community nurse to have that injection administered. It makes complete sense that that person would be able to come to a community pharmacy and that that would be a service that we would offer. So we are continually striving to say that there's more and more that we can do. The other very obvious one too, and it would be for very few people, but it is something that would make sense. When you consider that if people are traveling abroad or very far afield, particularly to South America or Southeast Asia, there are a definite cohort of injections and uh, vaccinations that they should have. For example, Japanese encephalitis vaccine. There's no reason why I can vaccinate somebody for the flu, but I can't vaccinate them for Japanese encephalitis. So those are the services that we wish to expand, having had a really, really good base of now up and running in our seventh year of thank season. Thank you so much. And thank you for your lecture once again. And as we have no questions uh, further, I would like